Sunday morning, we introduced the, the subject to us of the glory of God, and we're continuing to look at that this morning in just kind of a two-part series. Uh, we broke up or, or subdivided the topic of the glory of God into, into two categories. Last week, we dealt with that intrinsic glory, the intrinsic glory of God, and what that, what that means for us uh, the intrinsic glory of God refers to that glory that belongs to God and that is part of the very essence and nature of who God is. That our God is all glorious. Amen. Amen. Uh, that, that He has glory contained inside of Him and as such as being all glorious. That means that God will not allow His glory to be shared with anyone else without any kind of severe punishment. Uh, what the intrinsic glory of God really means in a nutshell for us is that if the Fellowship Baptist Church was to never sing about the praises of God again, if we were to never offer another verbal testimony, if we were to never render our thankfulness and gratefulness to God for life and for provisions and ultimately for this great salvation that we've experienced, if we were to never seek to glorify God again, that He would still remain as all-glorious as He ever has been because glory is, is just a vital and uh, an essential attribute of who God is, that He he retains glory no matter if we ascribe to him glory or not. That is the intrinsic glory of God. And then so this morning we come to look at a different facet of the glory of God. Not just the fact that God is glorious, but that God deserves glory. That is the ascribed glory of God that we render to God, that we declare God to be, that we, that we offer to God our praise and our thankfulness and our gratefulness and we brag upon Him and, and we do like the psalmist did and we say things like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want and He maketh me to lie down by green pastures and He leads me beside the still waters, He restoreth my soul and, and we brag on the Lord and we, we talk about the Lord being a strong tower and, and a refuge and we talk about Him uh, shadowing over us with His wings and His tender mercies and His love and His kindness and his grace and so he sings songs like in the red book page 54 amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me or we sing that there's power in the blood and we sing about being washed in the blood and we sing holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty the whole earth is full of his praise and full of his glory and we ascribe you see what I mean we ascribe this glory to God God this morning is all glorious he's all glorious and he will not allow his glory to be shared with anything else, with anyone else, without severe punishment. Consider with me this morning, by way of introduction, an example of this very thought from the Old Testament. You remember, recall with me this morning, that the temple itself was constructed to be a permanent dwelling place for God's glory. Uh, the, te the, the temple, the first temple constructed by Solomon, the preparations, of course, had been made uh, by, uh, by King David. Uh, God had not allowed David to, uh, to do those things, but he laid up in store. So Solomon comes along and, and, uh, and both begins and finishes the building project of the temple. And it was built to be a permanent dwelling place for God's glory. When the project was completed, you'll recall the story of how the cloud of God's glory descended and filled that place so much that the priest could couldn't even stand and minister inside of the sanctuary. Such was the glory of God. We refer to that as the Shekinah glory, that the tangible presence and glory of God filled that place, and no one could even move around. And such was the glory that was manifested in that place. The temple itself became a monument then, reflecting and ascribing the glory of of God. Oh, we could we could say without any apology this morning that, that the temple was the was the was the primary and premier monument in all of Israel. It, it defined Israel as being God's uh, earthly elect people. It separated them from all of the nations. It was it was the nation of Israel that had the testimonies, that had the law, had the had the had the ceremonies and the the prescribed method of the forgiveness of sins. And all of that was really wrapped up in this in this temple because it can Containing the Ark of the Covenant, remember that uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, which which contained the covenant, the two tables that were just received back in Exodus chapter number twenty, uh, and contained other uh, other items there, all symbolizing God's care and His provision and His love and His uh, interest in the life of the Israelites. 
Now we're told on one occasion in regards to this temple and to some other things that Solomon had constructed that there was a lady by the name of Queen of Sheba. And this prominent member of her society, this Queen of Sheba, became very interested by the reports and the stories that she had heard about Solomon and all of his glory and all of these magnificent uh, structures that he had, uh, that he had built. And, and uh, her curiosity was so piqued. And so she decided to go on vacation one day and take a trip over to Israel and come into Jerusalem. And she wanted to see all that Solomon had accomplished, primarily that of the temple. We're told in 2 Chronicles chapter number 9 and verse number 4 that her spirit actually departs out of her, uh, 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 an expression meaning that she became literally breathless as she, as she uh, viewed all of the magnificent uh, works that Solomon had erected and, and uh, again, uh, primarily speaking of the temple and its glory. I mean, you, you go back and read the Old Testament and just all of the materials and all of, I mean, just amazing structure and the Bible says that this Queen of Sheba becomes very breathless at all that the Lord, uh, really all that Solomon, if you will, had accomplished. Her report was to say to Solomon this in 2 Chronicles chapter number 9. She says, the one half of the greatness of thy wisdom, speaking of Solomon, was not told me. The one half, Solomon, she says, of thy wisdom was not told to me. She says, Solomon, I can't believe just how wonderful you are. I can't believe just how amazing Solomon is. I mean, just your glory. Just you are amazing in your wisdom. Unfortunately, we are never told in that same passage of Scripture or anywhere after that, that Solomon ever pointed her to God's glory. I believe that Solomon accepted what rightfully belonged to the Lord alone. Now, stay with me very quickly. Ironically, in Israel's history, and there begins to be this gradual decline inside of Israel. The glory of the Lord is never mentioned again in connection with that particular temple, ever again. The glory that had descended, the Shekinah glory, this presence of God that had descended inside that place and so filled it that the priest couldn't even stay and minister, couldn't stand and minister in that day. And just this, just this glory and the, and the reputation, just the, the idea of this temple began over a process of time, began de-evolving, if you will, the gradual decline in Israel the glory of the Lord is never mentioned again in connection with His temple. Idolatry begins to move in throughout the land. And eventually, by the time the prophet Ezekiel comes along, almost all of the right forms of worship had entirely disappeared out of Israel. Is it any wonder that God finally then allowed the Babylonians to come in to burn this particular building down? I'll tell you why God could allow such a magnificent structure like that that was erected for His glory to be desecrated in such a sense. I can tell you why God would have allowed that to happen. It's because His glory had departed from it. Ichabod was written above the doorway. God's glory, it was, it was no longer about the glory of God. It had just become another, another item. It had become another artifice. It, it, it had just become another structure inside of Israel. And, and when folks looked at it, they thought maybe possibly more about Solomon and more about Solomon's wisdom and Solomon's glory. It, it, was, it was known as not the Lord's temple. It was known as Solomon's temple. It, it belonged to him. It has his name on it instead of God's name associated with it. Now, just because a certain group of people stop giving glory to God again didn't mean that God had ceased to have glory, just like we saw last week. It didn't mean that God had become any less glorious. It didn't mean that, that, God, had, that God had lost anything, any of His essence, of His attributes. Uh, uh, we saw last week again in the intrinsic glory of God. What it means is that if we never contributed again to giving God glory ever again, that He would still remain just as glorious as He always had been. But just like in that story of the Old Testament, the temple was erected not, not only to not, not only as a, as, a, as a place of saying God is glorious, but to redound, to reflect God's glory so that when people came there, they, they thought not of Solomon, they thought not of gold and of brazen and all not of, not of just uh, uh, structures and pieces and equipment and furniture, but they thought of the very God of glory. And they said, and, and, and in looking at that structure, they thought, how glorious our God must really be. 
If you and I have failed in our God-given responsibility to give God glory, then we stand to be severely punished, I believe. Because all glory and all praise this morning belongs to the very God that has given us life. You ever stop to think about the fact that if God had never moved, that if God had decided not to create you, that you wouldn't be? Uh, Paul said in Acts chapter number 17 that it is in him that we live and move and have our being, uh, that we have our lives held together by God and by him alone, that, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so God says in Psalm 150, that let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise God. Ye the Lord. You want to know why God said that? Because we all owe to God by right of responsibility and necessity all our praise and all the glory we can offer to Him because it is He and He alone that has given us our lives. It is God that woke us up this morning to clothe us and put us in our right mind. It's, it's, it's God's provision that allows us to be seated on a church view instead of being hauled in the back of some ambulance to some hospital this morning. It's God that has allowed us to have our health and to have the mental capacity that we have this morning. It's God that has allowed us to have our spouses and to have our children and to, and to have everything that we have. The Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of lights in whom there is neither variableness, neither shadow of turning and all God says in connection with that is I just want my children, I want my creation to recognize what I've done for them and to offer me praise and thankfulness for what I have done inside of their lives. Back in Exodus chapter number 33, God had placed Moses inside of a cliff of the rock and he had allowed his glory and his goodness to pass before Moses and as a result, Moses' face if you will, if I can use a New Testament word that we'll look at here in just a moment together, it began to redound or to reflect, if you will, the glory of God. Now Moses had, had seen, had, had perceived, or if you will, he had come to understand in a more particular sense just how really glorious God was. And as a result of that, as Moses leaves from the mountain and he comes back down to the people, Moses' physical being, his physical expressions of life, namely his face, shone with the very reflection of the glory of God. So much so that the Bible says that the children of Israel had to put a veil on his face. So brightly was the fluorescent glow of Moses shining all the cause he had been in the presence of God and his face, his physical features were now, were now reflecting, if you will, that very glow of God. In a similar way, we're told inside of our text here in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 16 that the world around us as believers are to be able to look at us. And in looking at us this morning, they are to see something of this same glow that Moses had on his face. Not in necessarily in physical terms as a fluorescent glow, but, but Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, that they should be able to see our good works. And in seeing our good works, they are to glorify our Father, which is in heaven. I want to give to you just several words really quick before we actually get into uh, the main part of the message this morning. I think these will uh, be a big help to us as we come to understand more of what it means for us to ascribe glory to God. I want, to, I want you to jot down just a couple of words. The, the first two words I want you to jot down are the words attention and uh, allegiance. Maybe you'd say this morning, preacher, how is it that, that we come uh, as believers to give or to ascribe or to declare glory to God? How do I offer God glory? How do I, how do, I do that? Well, here's two words for you, attention and uh, allegiance. One way, one significant way that you and I offer to God our, our praise and glorify Him is that we give God our attention. Amen. Uh, we give God uh, the focus or the emphasis of our, of our lives. In, in other words, you, you ever had somebody that you're talking to and you can, you can tell that they're not paying attention? If you, if you haven't ever done that, I'll let you preach on a Sunday morning sometime. <laughs> Amen. Uh, have you ever, you ever tried communicating? And you can just tell. I mean, they're just, they're just you know, sometimes, if I can, if I can be honest <laughs> with you this morning, uh, amen, you let me do that. And if my wife would give me permission this morning uh, to do so, uh, sometimes uh, she'll be talking to me and she can tell <laughs> that I'm not listening. And, uh, and she always calls me on it because she always stops and asks me a question. And I think immediately, the only thing I have in my arsenal 
is to fake a heart attack. Because <laughs> I have absolutely nothing I just say, amen. And uh, you know, so, so you immediately start thinking, should I buy flowers? Uh, should I buy another vacation? Uh, what is it, amen? And, uh, and, and sometimes, sometimes the people that deserve our attention the most, sometimes we don't give it to them. We become, uh, we become distracted. We become, you know, just cares. And we're thinking about a million other, other different things. Well, well, listen, listen. The Bible tells us that our attention should be on God. In fact, Paul said it like this. He used the word affection. In Colossians chapter 3, he said, Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. And when God, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory, right? And so, and so this morning, our attention is to be on God. We're to be focused on God. What that means in, in practical, simplistic terms is, is that whenever I'm talking, I'm to have my attention on God. That is, I'm to be mindful of God. I'm to be careful not to offend by what comes out of my mouth. Uh, whenever, I, whenever I'm going places, is whatever I'm finding myself in doing, I'm to have my attention set on God. And then I'm to give God my allegiance. So, so if you were to examine my life and my behaviors for the past, let's say seven days, for the past week, if you would examine Brother Stanley's life, my behaviors, could you tell by looking at my life if, if my allegiance is to God or is my allegiance to something else? Right? Uh, am I am I am I alleged? Uh, do I have an allegiance to God, or is it if anything else comes up, I'll put that before God? Does God take a priority in our life? Here's here's two other words on the flip side of that. I'd like for you to jot down. These are the words distraction and disloyalty. Because this is the exact opposite of giving our attention and our allegiance to God. Just like I mentioned a while ago, we can't give God our attention as we ought to, sometimes because we're so distracted. That happens even inside of a church service like this. And, and the choir gets up here singing it. Miss Ashley gets up here singing it. The musicians are playing it. The preacher finally comes to preach it. Our minds are racing in a million different directions, thinking about work and thinking about school and thinking about uh, your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your husband or your wife. And you know, you're thinking about finances and bills are coming in and health issues and family problems and, and there's all these other kinds of things. And listen, I know each one of those deserves some form of attention, some form of focus in our life, but they ought never to distract us from giving our utmost and pri uh, our primary attention to God. It's so easy to get distracted, is it not? Right? I could, I could say to you uh, this morning, I could, I could tell you to hold on to a statement at the beginning of the message, and by the time I would get to the end of the message, if I was to say, what did I tell you to hold on to, most of us would be like, buh. <laughs> right. And then there's disloyalty, which is, which is evidenced by the fact that we haven't given our allegiance to God. Because anything that comes up, we'll make a commitment maybe today to read our Bibles every day of our life. To start our day off every morning before we go to school, before we go to work, to read our Bibles. And what do we do? We wake up a little bit late in the morning and we've got so many things to do that we do all of those things, but we don't read our Bible. And, uh, and we'll say, well, I'll do it at, at lunchtime. And then, and then we think about errands that we need to run. And we've got this to do or we've got that to do. And, and so there's a disloyalty. We'll say, we'll say yes, I'm going to come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We're going to be here through revival camp meetings. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna really plug in. We're really going to get faithful to this thing. And, and what do we do? We find ourselves becoming disloyal. Now, now, we wouldn't treat our jobs like that because we care about our jobs and our paycheck. Yeah. If, the, if the truth was told, most professing believers are nothing more than idolaters. Because we put everything else before God and we're more loyal to everything else. And at the end of the day, what we say about God is, well, He understands. Right. He does understand, but that's not necessarily in our favor. So let's, let's get down to, the, to, the, to the, where the river meets the road at this morning. How is it that we come to ascribe glory to God inside our life? What is it in practical, specific terms out of the lives of mere humanity, how do we come to glorify a thrice holy God that's in heaven? We're going to use our Bibles this morning. We won't normally do this, uh, but we're going to turn to uh, three different passages of Scripture this morning. So you're going to have to use your Bibles. And if you can't find these passages, what i found is if you'll just hold your Bible close and kind of hold the edges up, nobody will be able to tell if you're in the right place. All right? Turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number one. Here's the first thing this morning. The first, the first uh, means by which humanity, me and you, can come to give or to ascribe glory to God. I'm going to read several verses here out of Ephesians chapter number one. Let's pick up inside of verses four through verse number six. According as he hath chosen us in him... 
before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Now skip down to verse number 11. Paul says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will, that we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ. Then one more verse, verse number 14. Paul says, Which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Glory. If you're taking notes this morning, jot down the first way that we as, as humanity can come to ascribe glory to the very God that's given us life is this, the salvation of our souls. The salvation of our souls reflects, it redounds, it declares, and it ascribes God as being all glorious. Three times in this one chapter of Scripture, we see that our salvation calls attention to the glory of God. Paul says in verse number 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace wherein He has made us accepted in the Beloved. Verse number 12, that we should be uh, that we should be to the praise of his glory why who first trusted in Christ in verse number 14 which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession which is us unto the praise of his glory the first and essential feature for anybody any any man any woman any boy or any girl to ever fulfill this God-given responsibility for us as mere mortals uh, to ascribe and to declare God as being all glorious is when we in our hearts bow our will to the will of the Father and we accept Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and in that moment when God forgives our sin and writes our name down in the Lamb's book of life and justifies us in the courtroom of heaven and gives us a perfect standing before a thrice holy God. The Bible says that that is, is accounted to the praise of the glory of His grace. The salvation of our souls redounds, if you will, to the glory of God. The fact that God would extend forgiveness and complete salvation to sinful humanity humanity uh, reflects and magnifies the glory of God. You think about who you are, and I'll think about who I am for a minute. Let's think about the things we've said. Let's think about the things we've thought about. Let's think about some things we've done. Let's think about some of the things we've put in our body. Let's think about some things we've allowed to have happen in our body. Let's think about for a moment some things that we've taken that wasn't ours some of the things that we said that wasn't true let's think about the fall of foolishness which the Bible says is sin let's think about some of the Ten Commandments let's think about whether we've always put God first place let's think about if we've ever used the name of the name of the God that gave us life in the place of a four letter curse word use his name in vain have you always told the truth have you always honored your parents uh, listen there's 613 precepts uh, that were to be obeyed in the Old Testament law I, I added to that our New Testament commands like uh, like pray without ceasing, like love your enemies, like do good to those that despitefully use you, like, uh, like the Bible says that you shouldn't have jealousy in your heart, you shouldn't have bitterness in your heart, think about all these things that mount them against us and how dirty and rotten and sinful we really look and yet a God that not only has never done any sin but the Bible says knew no sin doesn't even comprehend sin. So much so that he's, he's so far high and holy above sin that the Bible says that he can't even be, even be tempted with evil. And yet that God of glory came down here and gave us life on an old rugged cross so the likes of you and me with sins too many to number could live with him forever. Paul says that first and foremost brings glory and honor and majesty when somebody like you and somebody like me bows the knee to Christ and accepts Him as their Savior. Stay with me real, real quick like inside of uh, Ephesians chapter number 1 right here. There are three facets of our salvation that are said to place light on His glory. First of all, in verses 4 through 6, we see the choice that was made. The choice that was made. Verse number 4, according as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Do you see that? Yes. You know what that means in plain English language? It means you didn't choose Him, He chose you. 
Now, I know that makes us nervous this morning, but the Bible's the Bible. <laughs> In fact, that's what Jesus said to his immediate disciples, right? You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go out and bear fruit. Amen. Aren't you glad this morning that there was a choice that was made? You want to know why Brother Stanley's excited that God chose him this morning? You can, you can rest in your, in your abilities and all of those things all you want to, but I'm glad God chose me this morning because I'm sure this morning on the testimony of the Word of God that if he hadn't chosen me, I'd have never chose him. Because the Bible says that, that there's none that understand it and there's none that seek it after God. If we understood two things this morning, if we understood just how holy God really is uh, and how sinful we really are, then buddy, we would run to the altar and we'd beg God for forgiveness of sins. They wouldn't have to sing 12 verses of just as I am. No preacher would have to beg you. Uh, you wouldn't have to come back 14 weeks before you got saved. Amen. If we really understood the grace of God and the depths of our sin and the free pardon of of that sin that God offers in the gospel, we'd run for mercy today. Can you imagine that? That the good God of all glory this morning, I chose us in Him. Charles Spurgeon said it like this. I don't like the way he said it. He said, I'm sure that God chose me to be saved before I ever was born because if He had waited until after I was born, He said, I'm sure He never would have chose me. Aren't you glad God fixed the plan of redemption before you ever got here? That before there ever was a sinner, there was a Savior. Aren't you glad that it was the blood of His cross? It wasn't just any cross. There's a lot of people that have been crucified. There's a lot of crosses in that day but thanks God thanks be to God the Bible says when the fullness of time had come on the right day at the right place there's a right man that went to the cross and stretched his arms out just like that and you said preacher how much does God really love me this morning how do you know he loves you that much amen enough to bleed and to die for you on an old rugged cross <laughs> amen this is a problem text for those wanting to avoid certain theological identities. Can I say this one? And I don't care what you call me this one. I'm just glad he chose me. These people attempt to explain that the apostle here meant to say that God has chosen us in him because we are already in him. But this cannot be true for several reasons. Number one, it can't be true grammatically. The word cho chosen means to select as in to pick. In other words, you didn't pick to be on my team. I picked you to be on my team. And you got on my team because I picked you. You picked me back. <laughs> Amen. Uh, it can be true because of contextually the grounds of this choice is on the good pleasure, the Bible says, of his own will. In other words, he didn't pick you because you picked him. He picked you because he wanted to pick you. <laughs> it can be true practically because do you suppose that there's enough goodness in any one of us to compel us to choose God and then have him choose us back? <laughs> the whole line of theology crumbles uh, because Jesus said in John chapter 3 that men will not, you want to talk about free willism? The Bible says men will not come to me. Uh, that they might have life. That men will not come to the light because they love darkness and their deeds are evil and they will not come to the light, Jesus said, unless their deeds should be reproved. If you ever do come to God, it'd be because God cut the light on you and he showed you how sinful you were. He showed you how good he is and he made the gospel real to you. I just say, oh, blessed day in my life when God made it real to me, praise God. Amen. Amen. What redounds to the glory of God, the salvation of our souls, the choice that was made. Secondly, inside of the text, not only was there a choice made, but there was a change that was rolled. <laughs> Amen. Look with me at verse number 14. The Bible says, which is the earnest of our inheritance. He's talking about the Spirit of God. The earnest of our inheritance. You know what happens? Uh, in a spiritual realm, the moment in time a person yields his life to Christ, uh, the moment in time a person bows and says, Lord, uh, would you come into my life and save my soul? In a spiritual realm, you want to know what takes place? We know what takes place in a physical realm. We know we see them kneel and we see them pray. We see them, you know, folks come over and hug them and sometimes they're crying and we wrap our arms around them. And, uh, Adrian, the last, uh, the last couple weeks ago, sister, I came into my office uh, and I wrapped his arms around me and, uh, and he said, thank you, preacher. We sit and he's going to be baptized. And we're familiar with all of the physical things, but in the spiritual realm, do you ever think about what happened? The moment in time before the sinner ever gets up off his knees, before anybody ever congratulates him, before he ever gets into baptismal waters, Brother John Love, the blessed Holy Spirit of God, the Bible says, comes to take up a permanent residence in the life of the believer quickens him by the Spirit of God and seals him, the Bible says in Ephesians 4.30, until the day of redemption. As somebody says, how do I know if I've got the Holy Spirit of God? Well, here's a good indication. Is there a desire in you to be holy? 
because the Holy Spirit of God, when He takes up His residence in your life, is going to begin leading you into right living, if you will. Not externally, not in terms of confirmation, but in terms of transformation. Just like a caterpillar makes that cocoon and eventually comes out into a beautiful butterfly. So God works a metamorphosis on the inside of mankind and He works from the inside out. He cleans up your heart and therefore your speech cleans itself up. He cleans up the inside and so the outside starts to look a little bit better. He starts sweeping up inside and all of a sudden the external things, you don't think the way you used to think. You don't talk the way you used to talk. He's a working in you. The Bible says both the will and the do of His good pleasure. You listen to me. Where you used not to care about coming to church, now you start caring. Where you used not want to read your Bible, now you want to read your Bible. Where you used not want to talk about the Lord, now everywhere you go you find yourself like that woman in John 4 who said, come see a man <laughs> which told me all things that ever I did. Yeah. Behaviorally. Amen. Inside of our life. There's a change. That's right. And it brings glory to God. Yeah. It's what Paul said. Paul said, your epistles read and known of all men everywhere. And what's he talking about? Well, here's the Bible. Here's the Bible. Here's the scriptures. Here's the, here's the New Testament epistles, right? Paul and Peter and John and Jude writing the epistles, and we, we read about them and we learn about our behaviors, we learn about the Word of God, we learn New Testament doctrine, but the reality, Brother Kendrick, is this, is that the world at large is never going to pick up a book. So God says, when I want them to know something about my character, God says, I put my spirit in every child of God that belongs to me so that they can see me in you. Yeah. And your life, the things that you used not to do that now you're doing, the things that you used to do that you don't do anymore, God says, that's redounding. That's reflecting my glory. There's another thing, not only the choice that was made and the change that was wrought, but the citizenship that's given, verse number 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Don't let that word predestination scare you. It's a good term. Amen. Amen. Don't let, it, don't let it scare you. What, what that means, amen, and, uh, in, in real terms, amen, is uh, if, if, you're a, if you're a good fisherman, I'm not a good fisherman. I'm not a good fisherman because I catch fish and I release because I don't care about eating them. Somebody say amen. And somebody said that fish tastes like chicken. Well, it's whole lot easier to just go buy chicken in the first place. All right? And, uh, and, so, uh, and so I'm not a good fisherman in, in those terms, but a good fisherman is somebody, Brother, Brother Robbie, is somebody that's going to go out and he's going to catch a fish, and, and when he catches a fish, he knows that fish is predestinated because he knows what's going to happen to that fish in the long run. He knows that fish is going to go home, he's going to get cleaned, and he's going to end up in a frying pan and on a plate and in somebody's belly. Somebody say, man, that's a predestinated fish. And what God says is when he catches us, we're predestinated. And what that means is the devil couldn't stop us from going to heaven if he wanted to. <laughs> Glory to God. What that means is somebody said, you think you could lose your salvation? I think it was your salvation. You could. But since it's his salvation, I think it's hands off territory. Amen. I think, uh, I think God's doing the work from start to finish. Amen. Somebody said them bunch of holy rollers over there. They just believe they're better than everybody else. Oh no. I believe I'm worse than everybody else. But see, there's one living on the inside of me. And the Bible said greater is he that's within me than he that is within the world. Amen. Paul said, what shall separate us from the love of God? Amen. Shall height, tribulation, peril, sword, nakedness, famine, any of these things. Paul said, Nay, in all of these things we're more than conquerors. Why? Through him that loved us and gave himself for us. Thank God. Peter, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15, that sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you to reason the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. God's made a change in our life and a change in our eternal destiny. Number two this morning. How do I ascribe glory to God? Well, the first way is the salvation of my souls. If you're here, of my soul, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, where you need to start at is not just, not just, not just church atten attendance. That's wonderful. We're glad you're here. And it's not just Bible study. And I'm glad you read your Bible. And that's wonderful. And you need to continue to do that. And those, those are means of graces. And we, we, we believe that, the grace of God. But what you need to do is to bow your heart to Christ. And trust Him. And the Bible says instantaneously, you are ascribing glory to God. Number two this morning, you jot it down. The source, oh, I'm sorry, the success of our experience. The success of our experience. Turning your Bibles back to John chapter number 15. If you have your Bibles open, John chapter number 15 and verse number 8 this morning. We'll try to speed this thing up a little bit. Y'all can listen fast. I'll preach fast. How about that? 
John chapter 15 and verse number 8, Jesus says, Herein is my Father glorified. So right there, our ears ought to perk up, right? Jesus says, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. The success of our experience. Now stay with me so you can see what I mean here. The notion that God has ever saved anyone to just take them to heaven is here disproved. The idea, the concept that God extends forgiveness and complete salvation to anyone just to eventually take that person to heaven whenever they die is absolutely foreign to the Holy Scriptures. You understand that? Here's what Paul wrote to Titus. Titus chapter 2 verse number 14 talking about Christ. That he gave himself for us. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses would have a hard time with that because in John chapter 3, verse 16, it was the Father that gave the Son, but in Titus 2, 14, the Son gave Himself. So either you got a contradiction or they're both the same person. I'll just give you that one. Amen. Who gave Himself for us. Amen. That He might do two things. First of all, redeem us from all iniquity. And aren't you glad that He's done that? Aren't you glad that every thought, word, and deed that you've ever done against the Lord, that in salvation you found the forgiveness of sin and God has erased that from your record. And not just the, the individual acts, but sin is not so much an action as it is a principle. You understand that, right? That when Jesus became sin, He didn't become homosexuality. He didn't become lies. He, he took on Him the principle, the entity of sin. Paul spoke of sin as if it were a person. He said, sin dwells in me and it's no longer I that do those things, but sin that dwells in me. So Paul took upon, or Christ took upon Himself that, that, that principle. And so in the, when a person receives the forgiveness that God offers to him in the gospel, he is being forgiven of having the principle of sin ever a part of him you understand that <laughs> I don't but I sure enjoy it <laughs> to know that because uh, what that means is it's not just what I've done in the past God's forgiven me for but the whole lump sum of my life is covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ he redeems us from all iniquity that's one reason why Christ died but it's not the total reason why Christ died secondly Paul would say in Titus 2 14 and to purify unto himself a peculiar people, here's the term I'm, uh, the expression I'm interested in, zealous of good works. It's <laughs> exactly what Jesus said back in Matthew 5 and verse number 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Say, preacher, how do I let my light shine? You do good works. You live for the Lord inside of your life. Now, such good works here are called fruit for us in John 15 and verse number 8. We are to... We are to bear, Jesus says, much fruit inside of our life. And this fruit is intended by the good pleasure of God to be part of every believer's life. Every believer's life. Verse number 16 of the same chapter, Jesus says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And if I've done that, Jesus says, I've ordained you. That correlates with Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10 that God has ordained that we walk in those good works. That you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. You understand? said that Jesus works the work of salvation in us not to just take us to heaven but in between now and then we live for his glory amen the success of our experience he didn't just save us to take us to heaven but he saved us to make to make a new creature out of us to show the world that God is setting us on display his glory isn't that amazing when uh, when in uh, back in Genesis 1 God stepped out on Nothing, and he made everything, right? And in doing